Welcome to the Chapter 9, Part 1 screencast. Our Earth's atmosphere is made up of a mixture of gases, and in fact, dry air is about 78% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen gas, about 1% argon, and then it also contains small amounts of other gases like carbon dioxide and ozone and nitrogen oxides and other things. And this unit is going to be the study of gases, one of the three phases of matter, or three normal phases of matter. Now, one of the first things, one of the most important things to know about gases is that all gases exert a pressure. Uh, the pressure has to do with or is caused by molecules moving around and um, colliding with the container that they're in and with other molecules. And for now, we'll deal with uh, gases on a macroscopic level and the relationships. And the gas pressure, or pressure in general, is defined as force per area. So P is pressure, F is force, and A is area. And the atmosphere of Earth exerts a pressure, just the gas molecules in our atmosphere, exerts a pressure of almost 15 pounds per square inch. So this would be something like having a bowling ball, maybe, sitting on your thumb uh, in terms of the pressure that we feel just due to the air uh, itself. Now, there are a number of different units used for pressure. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, symbolized by PA, and a Pascal is a Newton per meter squared. Newton is force, and meter squared is a unit of area. Uh, kilopascals are commonly used, atmospheres, bar, millimeters of mercury, tor, pounds per square inch, and more are units that are used for pressure. Um, and you should be able to relate uh, pressure in one set of units to pressure in another set of units, especially if you have access to the uh, conversion factors between uh, pressure in different units. So a couple things to note, a tor is 170, uh, 1 760th of an atmosphere. Um, an atmosphere is 101,325 pascals, uh, and so on. So let's try this uh, simple conversion notion first. If we're in Denver, where atmospheric pressure is lower than at sea level, and so on a typical day it might be maybe 622 millimeters of mercury, what's the pressure in atmospheres and what's the pressure in kilopascals? Well, we know the pressure is 622 millimeters of mercury. We go to the table and look up the conversion factor, and there are 760 millimeters of mercury that equal one atmosphere of pressure. And that gives us then, when we do the conversion, 0.818 atmospheres for the uh, air pressure, atmospheric pressure in Denver under these conditions. If we do the conversion to kilopascals, uh, starting with atmospheres is perhaps uh, more straightforward because we can look up a conversion between atmospheres and kilopascals and there are 101,325 pascals in an atmosphere, so that's 101.325 kilopascals in an atmosphere, and we do that conversion, and we get 82.9 kilopascals for the atmospheric pressure in Denver under these conditions. Now, on a macroscopic level, we characterize gases by four different quantities or variables. We can talk about the pressure of a gas, which we symbolize by P. We can talk about the volume of the gas, which we symbolize by V. We can talk about how much gas we have, and we could do this in different units, but we typically will use number of moles, N, and the temperature of the gas, which we symbolize by T. Remember that uh, a substance is going to be made up of very small particles, molecules, or atoms. And in a gas, those molecules or atoms are fairly far apart from each other. They're moving around constantly and chaotically, and they are occupying the complete volume of whatever container they are in. Now, it turns out that the various quantities or uh, variables 
that characterize a gas, the pressure, the volume, the number of moles, and the temperature. It turns out that the, those quantities have relationships between pairs of them, and we can determine those. So let's uh, do a couple uh, of these pairs. Let's start with volume and temperature. And if we have a balloon at a certain volume and at a certain temperature, and then we cool the balloon down to a lower temperature, so we decrease its temperature, we find out that the volume of the balloon decreases. Now this, of course, is providing that we hold the pressure constant and we don't add any more gas to the balloon. And then, of course, uh, conversely, if we have a container uh, of gas and uh, we increase its temperature, we find its volume increases. And if we do careful measurements of a quantity of gas trapped in a container that can change its volume and start with a certain volume at a certain temperature and then change the temperature, see the effect on the volume, what we end up doing is getting a relationship that looks like this when we graph it. So we get a straight line relationship between temperature and volume and the straight line actually hits a zero volume at negative 273 degrees Celsius. So careful experiments show a graph of V versus T is a straight line and the volume is equal to zero at negative 273 degrees Celsius, which of course is zero Kelvin. So what this means, of course, is that volume is directly proportional to temperature. It's a straight line relationship going through zero, zero, if, of course, the temperature is in Kelvin. And this relationship is known as Charles' Law. For a fixed amount of gas at a constant pressure, the volume and temperature are directly proportional, provided that the temperature is in Kelvin. What this also means is mathematically we can say V is equal to some constant times T, and since the constant is a constant, then if we divide both sides of this by T, we have V over T is a constant, and so if we change the circumstances from an initial state we might call V1 and T1 for the volume and temperature, to a new state V2 and T2 representing the volume and temperature, the V over T ratio will always equal K, which is a constant. So therefore V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So an example of how we would apply this idea is suppose we have a balloon at 27 degrees Celsius and it has a volume of 3 liters. Well, if we increase the temperature of the balloon, we would expect the balloon's volume to increase. And in fact, if we determine what temperature is needed for the balloon's volume to increase to 10 liters, we note that volume and temperature are directly proportional, providing, of course, the temperature is in Kelvin. So we go from 3 liters to 10 liters. That is an increase in volume by a factor of 3.33. And what that means is the temperature in Kelvin, which is 300 Kelvin, we'd expect to also go up by a factor of 3.33 which means that the temperature would go up to 1,000 Kelvin. Okay, now this is kind of a crazy example in a way because at 1,000 Kelvin, probably just about any balloon we would expect uh, to have melted, but providing we had a container that could withstand these sorts of temperatures, that is what we would uh, have for a temperature increase. Okay, let's try another pair of variables, this time temperature and pressure. And it turns out that if we have a gas trapped in a container, and if the volume of that container is constant, then if we decrease the temperature of the gas in the container, we find the pressure decreases. And if we increase the temperature, then the pressure increases. And if we're careful about measuring the pressure and seeing how it changes with respect to temperature, and this is done in lab, uh, we note that we get a straight line that goes through a zero pressure at negative 273 degrees Celsius, which is zero Kelvin. And so we have, when we do careful experiments, we find that a pressure versus temperature graph yields a straight line, and the pressure is equal to zero at negative 273 degrees Celsius, or zero Kelvin. 
What that means, of course, is that P and T are directly proportional to each other. And so mathematically, we could represent this, and the relationship is known as what's called Gay-Lussac's Law. It says that for a given amount, a fixed amount of gas at a constant volume, the pressure and temperature are directly proportional, providing we do the temperature in Kelvin. And pressure is equal to some constant times T, or directly proportional to T. And then with the same reasoning we did with the previous volume temperature relationship, this yields P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And we could do an example of this. If we have a balloon at 25 degrees Celsius with a volume of 5.2 liters, and we try to determine what the volume of the balloon is if it's cooled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, negative 196 degrees Celsius, what we would expect is there is our initial volume and initial temperature, and we would expect that the final volume would be significantly lower because the temperature is significantly lower. So how we calculate this is using Charles' law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We note that we'd better convert our temperature into Kelvin, which is 298 Kelvin for 25 degrees Celsius. The second temperature is 77 Kelvin for negative 196 degrees Celsius. And then to solve for the quantity we want, which is V2, we multiply both sides by T2. Therefore, V2 equals V1 over T1 and then times T2. And plugging in the numbers, 5.2 liters times 77 Kelvin divided by 298 Kelvin gives us, when the Kelvin cancel, a new volume of 1.3 liters which seems pretty reasonable. We expect the volume to go down significantly because the temperature went down significantly. So another example, we have a gas in a flask at a pressure of one atmosphere, and we increase the temperature. What happens to its pressure? Well, we expect that to increase. And the relationship we've seen before, how pressure and temperature are directly proportional. And so we have the pressure going from one atmosphere to three atmospheres. This is a factor of three increase in pressure. Therefore, we would expect the temperature to also go up by a factor of three. But of course, we have to convert our temperatures into Kelvin. So the temperature goes not from 27 degrees Celsius but from 300 Kelvin up to 900 Kelvin, an increase by a factor of three. So one more example before we finish this screencast. Uh, we have an aerosol spray can that has a volume of 375 milliliters. It contains gas at 1.6 atmospheres for its pressure and 23 degrees Celsius. And the can claims that if the temperature goes above 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius, it may burst. The question is, what's the pressure in the can at this temperature? So initially, we have 375 milliliters, 1.6 atmospheres, and 23 degrees Celsius. And our potential final state, note that the volume of the can it's a rigid can. It's not going to change or hardly change at all if it's heated up. Pressure we are trying to determine, and the temperature would be 60 degrees Celsius. So we use the pressure-temperature relationship, P1 over T1 equals P2 over V2. Solving for the pressure uh, for state 2 that we want to find, P2 is equal to P1 over T1 and then times T2. Convert our temperatures to Kelvin, 296 and 333 Kelvin, respectively. And note, that's not a very big increase on a percent basis, so we don't expect a really big pressure increase on a percent basis. And if we plug in our numbers, we have 1.6 atmospheres times 333 Kelvin divided by 296 Kelvin, and that works out to be, oops, excuse me, 1.8 atmospheres. And that's a good place to end the first screencast.